Welcome to our edition of Cranmer Studies. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? We turn now to uh, Gerald Bray's English Reformation documents, and he's quoting, citing William Tyndale's preface to the Bible. Wonderful set of comments. Concerning the word repentance, as they use to use the word penance, the Hebrew hath in the Old Testament generally, generally shuv, to turn or to be converted, for which the translation that we take for St. Jerome's hath most part converti, to turn or to be converted, or sometimes yet agere ponitentarium, to do penance. And the Greek in the New Testament have perpetually metanoeo, to turn in the heart and mind and to come to the right knowledge and to a man's right wit again. From which metanoeo, Jerome's translation, has sometimes been ago penitentum, I do repent. Sometimes penitento, I repent, I am repentant. I have repentance sometimes, penitent, it repenteth me. And Erasmus uses much this word, repiscopo, I come to myself, or to my right mind again. And the very sense and signification both of the Hebrew and also the Greek word is to be converted and turned to God with all the heart to know his will and live according to his laws and to be cured of our corrupt nature with the oil of his spirit and wine of obedience to his doctrine. Which conversion or turning, if it be unfeigned, these four do accompany it and are included in it. Confession. Not in the priest's ears, for that is man's invention, but to God in heart and before all the congregation of God, how we be sinners and sinful, that our whole corrupt nature is corrupt and inclined to unrighteousness. Then contrition, sorrowfulness for such, we be such damnable sinners not only have sinned, but are wholly inclined to sin still. And fourthly, satisfaction or amends making not to God with holy works, but to my neighbor whom I have hurt and the congregation of whom I have offended. If any open crime be found in me and submitting of man's self unto the congregation or church of Christ, and note this, that as satisfaction or amends making is counted righteous before the world and a purge of the sin, so that the world, when I have made full amends, hath no further to complain. Even so, faith in Christ's blood is counted righteousness and a purging of all sins before God. 27. Moreover, he that sinneth against his brother sinneth also against the Father Almighty God. And it's the sin committed against his brother is purged before the world with making amends and asking forgiveness. Even so, the sin committed against God purged through faith in Christ's blood only. For Christ saith, John 8.24, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That is to say, if ye think there is any other sacrifice or satisfaction to Godward than me, ye remain ever in your sins before God. Howsoever righteous ye appear before the world, wherefore now, whether ye call this metanoia, repentance, conversion, or turning again to God, either amending, or whether ye say ye repent, be converted, turn to God, amend your living, 
I am content so ye understand what it means thereof, as I have declared. Paragraph 28 from William Tyndale. Elders, in the Old Testament, the temporal heads and rulers of the Jews with governance over the lay or common people are called elders, as you may see in the four evangelists, out of which custom Paul and his epistles and also Peter called prelates and spiritual governors are bishops and priests. They're called elders. Now, whether ye call them elders or priests, it is to me all one, so that ye understand that they be officers and servants of the word of God, under which all men, both high and low, that will not rebel against Christ. 29, a prologue unto the four evangelists, showing what they were and their authority as for St. Matthew. As touching the evangelists, ye see in the New Testament clearly what they were. First Matthew, as ye read, was one of the Christ's apostles and was with Christ all the time of his preaching and saw and heard his own self almost all that he wrote. Number 30 of Mark, read Acts 2, 12, 12 to 17, how Peter, after he was loosed out of prison by an angel, came to Mark's mother's house, where many of the disciples were praying for his deliverance. And Paul and Barnabas took him with them from Jerusalem and brought him to Antioch, Acts 12, 25, and Acts 13, 5. Paul and Barnabas took them with him out to preach from whom he departed, as it appears in the said chapter, and returned to Jerusalem again. In Acts 15, 37 to 40, Paul and Barnabas were at variance about him. Paul not willing to take him with him because he forsook them in the first journey. Notwithstanding, yet when Paul wrote the epistle to the Colossians, Mark was with him. As he saith in the fourth chapter, of whom Paul also testifies, that both he was Barnabas' sister's son and also a fellow worker in the kingdom of God. And 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul commanded Timothy to bring Mark with him affirming that he was needful to him to minister to him. Finally, he was also with Peter when he wrote the first epistle, and so familiar with Peter called him his son. Whereof ye see of whom he learned his gospel, even from the very apostles, and whom he had continual conversation, and of what authority his writing is, and how worthy of credence, William Tyndale, preface to the Bible. And now for Prof. Philip Edgecum Hughes, as he gathers up the book, The Theology of the English Reformers, God's Instrument of Salvation. From the New Testament, as has already been briefly mentioned, the Reformers learn that preaching is not is not just an option or an extra, but a divinely appointed necessity for the church. Latimer calls it categorically God's instrument of salvation. And again, on another occasion, take away preaching and take away salvation. Or again, in his second sermon on the Lord's Prayer, he declares, this office of preaching is the office of salvation. For St. Paul saith, visum est Deo per stultitium praedictione salves quacres credentis. It hath pleased God to save believers by the foolishness of preaching. How can men then believe but by and through the office of preaching? Preachers are Christ's vicars. When preaching before Edward VI on 12 April 1549, Latimer is insistent that we cannot be saved without hearing the word of God. It is, he declares, a necessary way to salvation. 
we cannot be saved without faith, and faith cometh by the hearing of the word. Fides ex auditu. And how shall they hear without a preacher? I tell you, it is the footstep of the ladder of heaven. There must be preachers if we look to be saved. With characteristic humor, and his humor is never without point or purpose. Latimer tells his distinguished office the story of a gentlewoman of London. One of her neighbors met her in the street and said, Mistress, whither go ye? Mary, said she, I am going to St. Thomas of Acres to the sermon. I could not sleep all last night, and I am going now thither. I never failed of a good nap there. And so, Latimer observes, I had rather ye go napping to sermons than not to go at all. For with mine, soever ye come, though ye come for an ill purpose, yet peradventure ye may chance to be caught before ye go. The preacher may chance to catch you on his hook. It is declared in many places of scripture how necessary preaching is, he explains. Evangelium es potentia dei, ad salutum omnicredenti. The preaching of the gospel is the power of God to every man that doth believe. He means God's word opened. It is an instrument and a thing whereby we are saved. Here you may see how necessary this office is to our salvation. This is the thing that the devil wrestleth, wrestles most against. It hath been all his study to decay this office. He worketh against it as much as he can. He hath prevailed too much, too much in it. He hath set up a state of unpreaching prelacy in this realm this 700 years. And so he admonishes his hearers, beware, beware, ye diminish not this office. Nor should preachers imagine that the pulpit is the only fitting place from which to deliver a sermon. The message is to be proclaimed under all circumstances and wherever opportunity may offer. Latimer cites the example of Christ who preached from a boat. It was a good pulpit that our Savior had gotten him there, an old rotten boat, and yet he preached his Father's will, the Father's message, out of this pulpit. He cared not for the pulpit, so he might do the people good. Accordingly, a good preacher may declare the word of God sitting on a horse or preaching in a tree. And yet, if this is so should be done, the unpreaching prelates would laugh it to scorn. And though it be good to have a pulpit set up in the churches that the people may resort thither, yet I would not have it superstitiously used, but that in a profane place the word of God might be preached sometimes. And I would not have the people offended with all, no more than they be of the Savior's preaching from a boat. And yet to have pulpits in churches, it's very well to have them, but that they would be occupied. As he points out in a sermon preached at Stamford on 9 November in 1550, Christ knew what charge hangs upon this necessary office of preaching, preaching the office of salvation, and therefore most earnestly applied it to himself. Advice concerning the manner of preaching is given by Pilkington in his exposition on Nehemiah. Good nature, he says, are moved rather with glad tidings of the gospel than the sharpness of the law. We will pick that point up in our next session. Turning to Margot Margo Johnson's Thomas Cranmer, and uh, some comments by Hugh Bates on the worthy communicant. communicant. True to Article 29, Cranmer insists 
on the impossibility of an evil person being able to receive the body of Christ, directly contradicting St. Thomas Aquinas. Good and evil men are sharing one repast, a doom preparing buried as the heart of man. By contrast, to cite a representative passage, all men good and evil may with their mouths visibly and sensibly eat the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. But the very bl body and blood themselves may not be eaten, but spiritually. And that of spiritual members of Christ, which dwell in Christ and have Christ dwelling in them, by whom they be refreshed and have eternal life. The wor worthy communicant who feeds on him by faith with so thanksgiving is united to Christ and is made a very member in corporate of the mystical body. The unworthy communicant does not and cannot receive the body and blood of Christ. But this is not to say that the act of eating and drinking was simply null and void for him. If he does not discern and make a difference of the body that he is surely eating and drinking damnation to himself. His lack of faith and hardness of heart effectively exclude him from having any part in Christ. His, um, so for a wicked man to receive the body and blood of Christ is both illogical and a theological impossibility. If Christ is not truly and spiritually present, it must be that he is truly and spiritually absent. The absence of Christ is nothing more or less than damnation. Far from being a temporary expedient, the order of communion 1548 became more and more deeply embedded in the communion services of the two later prayer books. In 1549, the exhortations are placed after the creed and have been parted from the invitation, confession, and absolution which precede the communion. Now, in the New English rite, priest and people communicate together. But in the second book of 1552, the two parts of the order are once more united. Throughout the process, one substance of the hortatory material is largely retained, but adapted and rearranged to match the situation as it develops. For example, the procedure for announcing the intention to celebrate and for repelling notorious sinners has become properly established. Significant also has become the net, net necessary for the curate to rebuke the congregation for persistent non-attendance. As ever, devotional habit lags far beyond theological progress. By 1552, the private mass was a thing of the past. Curate and people communicated together or not at all. If at the end of the liturgical marathon of Matins, Litany, and Anti-Communion, the parson invited all who truly and earnestly repent to draw near and join him at the Lord's table, and nobody approached, that was the end of business. What used to be the canon of the Mass has, in 1552, now been fully incorporated into the 1548 order, which is now the heart and core of the rite, and has been neatly tailored to correspond with and express its theology. Grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy instruction, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night in which he was betrayed is necessary to pick up and make fully explicit the holy instruction. The Savior instituted a perpetual memory of his precious death and commanded that it be continued until his coming again. And this is the way that he did it.
we'll pick up that again as we turn to Professor. Oh, hi, Pamela. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, and we are now turning to Prof. McCulloch on Thomas Cranmer. And we're in and about, I believe it is, the six articles. I think that's where we left off. Parliament reconvened on May 30th, 1539 is what I think we're at. By that time, it was clear that the broad content of the six articles had been accepted and that all that remained was to turn them into a parliamentary statute with penalties attached for their disobedience. Now two new committees of bishops were appointed from the House of Lords, this time separately representing opposed party views, with a canon lawyer attached to either to advise on the drafting. On the one side were Cranmer, Goodrich, and Barlow, on the other, Lee, Tunstall, and Gardner. Gardner's first appearance in a prominent role in the proceedings was another sign for the reformers' route. So far, we followed the necessarily complex narrative of events at Westminster and noted the way in which the king in person was elbowing aside Cromwell let alone Cranmer, from the determination of policy. But what had made Henry determine this change of direction? He was faced with much the same diplomatic situation above, and he reacted in an opposite way to the previous year, more or less ignoring the hapless German representatives in London from whom he had hoped to gain great things. Another factor must, must have tipped the balance in his multi-form calculations to his own advantage and brought the traditional side of his jackdaw-like theological outlook. The most likely candidate is that old running sore of Cranmer's diocese, the religious standoff in Calais. For once more, religious trouble had flare, flared up there. Part of the dispute was triggered by Cranmer's commissary, John Butler. Butler was still doggedly using his jurisdiction to pursue the godly cause as he had done for a half a decade. But this time a new and dangerous coincidence intervened. In early spring, the Earl of Hertford went to Calais on an inspection of the military defenses and the Calais traditionalists sieged the chance to complain about Butler's personal version of the church militant and also about other sacramentaries, that means Swiss reformed. By the time Cromwell heard of all this, the complaints had formally been made to Hertford, to Sir Anthony Brown and others in the royal court. Cromwell wrote on 6 May from his convalescence to Lord Lyle, telling him to investigate. It was noticeable that he used the current royal buzzword of evil omen for the evangelicals, quote unquote, diversity of opinion. For already the king had become involved and wanted to know the truth of these matters in Calais. Cromwell was also annoyed and alarmed that he'd been bypassed in letting his royal master have the information, so potentially dangerous for his own situation. Cromwell's mention of Brown is also additionally significant. Sir Anthony was an influential courtier who was a friend of the Lyles and of Gardner, and was likely that he was the conduit for the poison about Calais reaching the king. Any investigation which involved Brown was not going to be the usual whitewash for Kali evangelicals, 
which Cranmer and Cromwell had tried so many times. Sir Anthony Lyle also kept Lyle fully informed as to what was going on in London, including the sequence of events up to May 30, which we've already surveyed. Lyle thus secretly primed Brown and with his own staff of informants in the capital, knew that at long last he could hope for success if he rounded up his Kali enemies, as long as he acted with discretion. I beseech you, he begged Brown on May 30, keep this my letter close, for if it should come to my Lord Privy Seal's knowledge or ear, I were half undone. He told Brown that he'd written to Cromwell plainly, a note of confidence which was normally absent from his dealings with the Lord Privy Council, reminding him of no fewer than three previous letters complaining that I am not able to serve the King's Majesty here without obedience. The theme of obedience was a promising line to pursue in order to secure Henry's continuing interest. Meanwhile, through my, the Kalai Council, despite the opposition of its evangelical sympathizers, met to gather deposition of the troubles duly forwarded to Cromwell. The saga, the six articles in May 1539. And we jump around a little bit here. We pick up with the hand of Cromwell discussing the situation of the monasteries. Cromwell's scheme, however, was no development of Wolsey's scheme on the monasteries. He proceeded to divert the wealth of the monasteries into the royal exchequer. According to one theory of his aim, he perceived that they were dens of iniquity instituted an inquiry which more than justified his worst anticipations, crushed the evil thing for the public good, and restored to the state the revenues which had been so so grossly abused by his tr the trustees. According to the other extreme theory, the whole beast piece was a sheer robbery utterly without excuse. The fact appears to be that there was really a strong case for the abolition of the system, an ample ground for confiscation in individual cases, but that the evidence on which the wholesale despoliation was said to be justified was never made public and had been gathered by methods which in any case would have deprived it of real weight. While the use to which the spoils were put was wholly iniquitous, the process was simple. The king, as supreme, had delegated to Cromwell as his vicar general full powers to act and appoint commissioners at his pleasure. On the basis of interpreting the supremacy as an unqualified autocracy, the visit the vicar general instituted a visitation by creatures of his own. Lee, Leighton, Aprice, Peter, London, who bullied the monks, accepted confessions and information from discontented inmates, treated refusals to answer the most insulting questions as admissions of guilt, and succeeded generally in collecting a vast amount of unsifted scandal. So much is absolutely certain from the letters of the commissioners. According to tradition, their reports, accompanied by written confessions, were put together. A black book of the damning proofs was laid before a horror-stricken parliament. The monasteries were wiped out to a chorus of stern applause from all right-thinking men. And the reactionists in Mary's reign sieged the brief moment of their triumph to make way 
make <coughs> make away with the record of enormities. In fact, however, while no one will dispute that to many, perhaps most honest men, the monasteries in bulk were anathema, <coughs> the rest of the story is unconvincing. Hugh Latimer declared that when a tale of iniquity was told in Parliament in February 1536, it was received with a universal down with them, which is probably true enough. Though on the other side, we are told that the House took much stirring before it would pass the Attendant Act. The records, however, go to show that what was laid before the House was not the evidence which had stopped short with the King and Cromwell, but broad allegations as to which His Majesty declared that he had found them fully proved. Such an announcement was sufficient for the Parliament. As for the Black Book, no explicit account of it is known till Elizabeth was on the throne. The description of its character is suspected of being mythical. Of lost reports and confessions, nothing remains but some manuscript summaries known as the Comperta, and the existing data make it hardly less likely that it was the Protestants who destroyed the reports because of the inadequacy of the evidence they contained than that the Romanists did so because of what they revealed. The monasteries. And now for Leslie Williams on the royal supremacy. We beseech thee, Almighty God, mercifully to look upon thy people, that by thy great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore, both in soul and body, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Cranmer landed in the middle of several hot spots. The people of England were not prepared to deal with religious and political changes of the magnitude thrust upon them. Popular opinion still favored Catherine over Anne, and Cranmer had to learn how to deal with Catherine's die-hard supporters in high places. Bishop Fisher, Fisher and some of the old nobility tried to egg on the emperor to declare war and invade England, while others talked of civil war. England split into a two-party religious system, but neither party had control. Henry VIII had control, and he intended to keep it. Both papal sympathizers and Protestant sympathizers could only use subtle and covert influence in helping shape the new church. Henry made the religious decisions going back and forth between the two camps of religious leaders. This teeter-totter stabilized when Elizabeth became the fulcrum, but swung wildly out of control in the following century of civil war over religion. Cranmer's action as an archbishop can be made plain by understanding his two guiding principles in play from the moment he took the second oath at his consecration. These convictions ran deep in his psyche. First, his belief in the importance of scripture that needs to really be undergirded had already shown itself in his thorough examination of candidates for ministry at Jesus College, and in his stand that scripture superseded the Pope's authority in Henry's annulment dispute. Secondly, now that Henry VIII had stepped over the Pope as the official head of the Church of England, Cranmer's belief in royal supremacy drove every decision he made until the moment right before Henry died. The acts and events surrounding Cranmer's consecration, especially the kangaroo court of the Dunstable verdict, 
and Henry's subsequent marriage to Anne angered Pope Clement VII and moved him to act. On July 11, 1533, he drew up a sentence of excommunication from Rome, although he deferred its publication. It was still waiting. For several months, the Pope continued to try to maintain his influence in England, but that was a dying cause. In the meantime, Henry withdrew his ambassadors to Rome. One of Cranmer's first tasks that summer of 1533, after his consecration and that goofy Dunstable trial, was to deal with the the disciple John Frith, an English reformer who wrote out some of the first Protestant views against the doctrine of transubstantiation, which we call the bone-muncher-cruncher view, a belief that the accidents, the outward appearance of bread and wine, remained while the inner substance of each was turned into the actual corporeal body and blood of Christ during the Eucharist. Frith argued that bread remained bread. After all, it molds, it breeds worms, mice can nibble on it and run off with bread in the mouth. Frith was imprisoned in the Tower of London and threatened with execution if he didn't recant his views. Sympathetic, I don't not sure about that here in 1533. Sympathetic, no. Cranmer tried three or four times to talk him out of his position, but Frith refused to listen. Frith argued and argued well that belief in transubstantiation and purgatory was not necessary for salvation, making a good case for doctrinal dissent. Even though he was given a chance to escape, he refused, determined to make his stand. He was burned at the stake on July 4, 1533, and Cranmer has blood on his hands. The question of transubstantiation was to plague England through Henry's tenure, creating other martyrs. Cranmer's private views on the Eucharist grew in time to resemble Frith's, maybe by 1547, some 14 years later. But only after Henry's death could he go public with his beliefs. Another one of Cranmer's early firestone storms involved the mystic visionary and nun, Elizabeth Barton, nicknamed the Maid of Kent, Barton had succumbed to a neurotic fit, perhaps epilepsy, resulting in religious hysteria in which she claimed to prophesy disaster to Henry if he went through with the annulment and marriage to Anne. Pleased with her notoriety, she continued to claim that the Virgin Mary had told her directly if Henry should divorce Catherine, he should no longer be king of this realm and should die a villain's death. After Anne became queen on 1 June or 31 May 1533, Barton continued to predict doom and gloom for the royal couple. Her behavior had been investigated and sanctioned, approved by the previous archbishop, William Warham. But others became involved. John Fisher, who was the vice chancellor of Cambridge University and well known to Cranmer, and who had also become a bishop of Rochester, as well as Sir Thomas More, the former chancellor of the realm, corresponded with her. Henry knew something had to be done, so her case was assigned to Cranmer. 1533, that summer, she will die, as well as John Frith. Turn now to Thomas Cranmer, Paul Eris's edition. 
as we look at Brian Spink and his commentary on liturgical issues. The summary statement at the end of the seven sacraments stated, for by baptism we be incorporated into the body of Christ's church, obtaining in that sacrament remission of sins and grace, wherewith we be able to lead a new life. To these three effects of baptism, remission of sin, incorporation of grace, the section on confirmation lists a fourth. All such as had duly received the sacrament of baptism were by virtue and efficacy thereof perfectly regenerated in Christ, perfectly incorporated and made very members of his body and had full remission of their sins and endued with graces and gifts of the Holy Ghost. These four effects or concerns of baptism are set forth in the 1549 rite. The opening exhortation begins with the theme of original sin and then speaks of regeneration by water and the spirit and being received into Christ's church. The Sarum Missal Prayer, Almighty and Immortal God, stresses remission of sins and spiritual regeneration. The exorcism of being made members of his body and holy congregation and the exhortation after the gospel teaches that through baptism, the candidate is made partaker of the heavenly kingdom. And it's clear that Anglicanism has never steered clear of that concept of baptism regeneration head for head reformed Episcopalian steered through that carabidus and skilla these theological resonances are strengthened by the linguistic echo from the king's book thus if the few words of the opening our exhortation are from Herman von Weed a Lutheran lit liturgist Practically all the rest resembles a, a precise part of the third paragraph in the sacrament of baptism. More, we quote here, moreover, because all men be born sinners through the transgression of our father Adam, in whom, as the apostles say, if all have sinned and cannot be saved without the remission of sins, which is given in baptism by the working of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the sacrament of baptism is necessary for the attaining of salvation and everlasting life, ex opere operato. According to the words of Christ saying, no man can enter the kingdom of God except he be born again of water and the Holy Ghost. The words of the signing of the cross manfully to fight under the banner of against sin, the world, and the devil, and to continue his faithful soldier and servant unto life's end finds a parable parallel in the article of justification. Sworn to be servants of God and be soldiers under Christ, to fight against our enemies, the devil, the world, and the flesh and also in the section on the sacrament of confirmation, as well as confess boldly and manfully their faith before all persecutors of the same, and to resist and fight manfully against their ghostly enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as also to bear the cross of Christ. Renunciation also seems to have been influenced by the language of the King's Book, the prayer book interrogation, dost thou forsake the carnal desires of the flesh so that thou wilt not follow nor be led by them, seems to draw from the following words, that such carnal and fleshly lusts and desires shall or can in no wise hurt us if we do not consent unto them. And by the grace also conferred on us in baptism, we be made more strong and able to resist 
and withstand the said concupiscence. And in the latter part of the final exhortation, <coughs> for as much as these children finds a parallel in the 1543 book, and we again upon our part ought most diligently to remember and keep the promise that we in baptism made to Almighty God, that is to believe only in him, only to serve and obey him, to forsake all sin and all works of Satan, to mortify our affections of the flesh and to live after the spirit in new life. Of course, since Cranmer had been involved in the compilation of the King's Book, he may well have been drawing on his own material here. This does not alter the fact that, however, his doctrinal writings and those of others became a source of liturgical composition. Lastly, Cranmer made, makes the right his own through his own editions and his style of translation and of liturgical in English. His well-known love of doubling words is illustrated in the illustration after the gospel gesture and deed, faithfully and devoutly. He applies the same style to the renunciations. In the Sarum rite, there are three questions. Dost thou renounce Satan and all his works and all his pomp, pomps? Following Herman, but more concisely, Cranmer has. Dost thou forsake the devil and all his works? Dost thou forsake the vain pomp and glory of the world with all its covetous desires of the same? His Latin style comes out again in the exhortation before the renunciation and the relative clauses and adverbs before infinitives. We'll resume that in our next session. Jasper Ridley's Thomas Cranmer on the fall of Thomas Cromwell, Crom Cromwell which, to which Cranmer gave his vote of affirmation. Cromwell was beheaded on 28 July, 1540. On 30 July, Barnes, Garrett, and Jerome were burned at Smithfield, while simultaneously three priests were hanged, drawn, and quartered at a few yards distance for their denial of royal supremacy. This grisly co-execution of papists and heretics after they had been dragged to Smithfield with one papist and one heretic together on each hurdle made a great impression on the people and Fox has given a remarkable explanation of it. He says there was a division in the council between what he calls the Protestants and the papists with the Protestants demanding execution of the three traitors and the papists denouncing, demanding death for the three heretics. It was therefore agreed to execute them all. Fox states that the Protestant counselors were Cranmer, Suffolk, Edward Seymour, John Dudley, Russell, Paget, Sadler, and Audley and the Papists were Gardner, Tunstall, Norfolk, Southampton, Brown, Pollitt, Baker, Rich and Wingfield. When Fox wrote this passage, he can hardly have been in a good position to know about the discussion in the council 23 years before, for he had not yet met Maurice, who might have acquired the information as Cranmer's secretary it is unlikely that the bloody compromise of execution of all six men was actually agreed upon between the two factions in the council, but it was undoubtedly safer in 1540 for both sides to denounce papists or heretics rather than attempt to save their supporters. And as Cranmer would not have dared to make a plea for the three reformers, and Gardner had no wish to save the three papists. 
the decision of a council to advise the king to execute them all was doubtless unanimous. In April 1540, Cromwell had announced the establishment of a commission consisting of two archbishops, six bishops, and 12 other divines for the purpose of examining Christian institutions. At first, the commission sat on six days a week. But later, they adopted the method of replying to questions in writing and during the summer and autumn, Cranmer drafted the 17 questions on the sacraments for himself and his colleagues to answer. The commissioners, after first serving their individual answers, held discussions amongst themselves, as a result of which many of them were able to agree on joint replies, though it was impossible to reach unanimity. A further document containing these revised and joint opinions was then submitted to the king. Cranmer, <clears throat> after originally giving his separate answers to his own questions, <clears throat> later wrote a second set of answers together with Barlow, Bishop of St. David's, which on some points gained approval of some of the other commissioners. The opinions which Cranmer expressed in the second document were strikingly different from those which he had put forward on the first document. Cranmer, the answers were drafted 12 April and before 29 December 1540, when Thurlby was consecrated Bishop of Westminster, for he is referred to as the elect of Westminster in the document. This led Jenkins to suppose the answers were drafted after 17 September 1540. The 17 questions dealt with three main issues, the number and origin of sacraments, the prince's power to appoint and consecrate bishops and priests, and the necessity for confession. On the question of sacraments, Cranmer in the first document stated his belief that the early author sp spoke of far more than seven sacraments, but all these sacraments, only baptism, Lord's Supper, penance, and matrimony were instituted as sacraments in Scripture. He adhered to this in his later answers, though he and Bal Barlow and altered the wording of his earlier answers so as to weaken the effect on nearly every point. With regard to confession, there was likewise no actual contradiction between Cranmer's first and second answers. But the second answers are so evasive as to give a complete different impression. To the question as to whether a man was bound by scripture to confess his sins to a priest, Cranmer first replied, a man is not bound by authority of this scripture, quorum or miseritis and such like, to confess his deadly sins to a priest, although he may have him. In the second document, Cranmer wrote, he that knoweth himself guilty of any secret deadly sins must, if he will obtain the benefit of absolution ministered by the priest, confess the same secrets unto him. This was nothing less than a cowardly evasion. It was in connection with the appointment and consecration of clergy that Cranmer changed his, abs, his attitude most conspicuously. And we'll draw this here to a close. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? I am convinced that nothing but nothing can separate us from the love of God. Until next time, Godspeed.